What's up, everyone? Josh White here. Just got done with episode numero uno of the Hero Front podcast, and I had the best guest ever, a best friend of mine, a mentor, someone who's watched out for me my entire life. I'm talking about my pops, all right? I'm talking about my dad, Major Bill White, retired. Um, He worked as a civilian on the Military Board of Corrections at Andrews. He was in the Guard. He was enlisted. He was an officer. He was a commander. He's learned a lot. And he shared a lot of those experiences with us uh, in my very first episode. So please, it's on all the streaming, um, you know, sites to to listen to podcasts. It's also on YouTube under Hero Front if you'd like to see the video portion. Either way, show us some love. Give it a a listen and let me know what you think. More to come, y'all. Big things uh, ahead for the Hero Front podcast. Thanks, everyone, for your support. I do want to start from the very beginning. Okay. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about your life, your, you know, what kind of built upon your values. And what okay. and how you carried those values on to adulthood and into your very long Air Force career and civilian career uh, with the <laughs> DOD, just so you know the listeners can have an idea about who you are, where you sure. came from, etc. Okay. Well, you know, first off, I, I have to tell you, Josh. I know this is your first podcast, and I'm honored and privileged to be a part of it, actually to be part of your first one. So I just want to let you know that and uh, let you know I love you and I appreciate you. And I'm I'm really, really honored to be here tonight. So anyway, to get back to your question. Well, you know, that means the world to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and okay. if the listeners don't know, my dad is my hero, my role model. And, wow. um, you know, he's he's been my compass for my life um, with marriage and my kids and my career, you've just, you've always been my compass, you know, and you keep me on track. So. Well, I appreciate that, son. I really do. So anyway, to get, get back I'm making to you, you cry uh, at the very beginning. <laughs> you do a what now? I said, I'm making you cry already at the very beginning. <laughs> we haven't even gotten started. Buckle uh, up folks. You know what? It's easy to do when you're talking to your grown up children who are just phenomenal people. So Anyway, all right, so let's get back to what you asked me. Let me give you a quick synopsis of my, uh, my life. Um, I was born in 1956 in July. I'm 64 years old. Um, I grew up uh, actually as a dependent in the Air Force. My dad was in the Air Force for 23 years. Um, I'm to go through our assignments really quick. I guess we, our first assignment was Alberta, Canada, then Fort Knox, Kentucky. After that was Keesler Air Force Base, and then RAF Crouton in England in the UK. Uh, we went to Robbins Air Force Base after that. Then we went to a really neat place um, called Carmicel, Turkey, and it's called Carmicel Common Defense Installation, which is KCDI. I was there, uh, well, actually, we were there twice. So we went to KCDI, then we went to Kelly when I was in the eighth grade, and then we went right, we loved Turkey so much, we went right back there for another three years. <clears throat> so uh, in 1974, we left Turkey for the last time and went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where Dad retired. And after, <clears throat> like I said, after 23 years, and then uh, he, we went to West Virginia to live because that's where both my mom and Dad are from. Actually, I'm from there, and so is Josh. So, um, as I said, I said I, I served 26 years in the Air Force, and that, actually, if you say Air Force, it was more like the Air Force and the Air National Guard. Um, I think they're pretty much both the same thing. Um, there's some differences there, just like with the Air Force Reserve, uh, but we're all Air Force. Air Force is in all of our names, you know? So anyway, that's that's pretty much my history. Um, let's see you what else. I that there. your dad was in the Air Force too. He was. Do you think that shaped your mindset a little bit? Did that give you something to look forward to? You know, were you shaping some goals at that point or? Well, yeah, there's no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I read a story somewhere a long time ago where it said that most dependents, especially dependent males, uh, you know, uh, male children um, who whose fathers were in the military usually follow that path. I can't remember the percentage, but it was pretty high. Um, So I know I was faced with either uh, I had like three jobs after we got back to the States and I was in uh, high school. I had like three different jobs and I was ready to do something new. I wanted to go to, <clears throat> I wanted to go to college, but I knew I couldn't do that. I couldn't afford it. I knew my folks couldn't cause I'm, I'm the oldest of uh, six kids. Um, so I thought, well, 
you know what, I'm going to get in the Air Force and we're going to go from there and see what happens. And uh, <laughs> I signed up in March 2nd, 1975. And uh, I signed up for, actually, I had to leave for basic on June 2nd, 1975, about three months later. And I remember in that three month period, a lot of different things happened in my life. And I was thinking to myself, I'm not really sure I want to do this now, you know? So I called my recruiter up and I said, <laughs> it probably happens a lot. I called the recruiter and said, hey man, I'm not really sure I'm going to do this. I mean, college is looking like a possibility now. I mean, he's like, dude, you rose, you raised your right hand. You already swore in. I'm like, gotcha. Oh, yeah, you're right. Huh? I said, gotcha. <laughs> he got me. <laughs> I'm sure they hear that all the time. You I'm know, sure they do. probably almost daily, actually. Especially on the delayed enlistments, because I had three months to think about it. See. Yes, I was on that as well. Um, yeah. And man, that's a lot of time to think about losing. Your that's friends. a lot of time you know, walking away from your family, your friends. I mean, yep. it's, it's a brave thing to do to leave. To I have to training. tell you the, the, the day I left for uh, basic training was probably the scariest day of my life. I have to say, and I've had some pretty scary days, but that was the scariest day of my life leaving, you know, the comfort and security of your home with your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters. And uh, even though I was really familiar with the air force, this was on me, you know what I mean? So um, that was a scary day. That it's was never, June second, nineteen seventy-five. Life is never going to be the same again. That's what. That's what's happening. <laughs> that's it, what's on everyone's mind who's on that bus as it pulls in. Yeah. Ti's are just you yep. know chomping at the bit, going ballistic. Yep. You know, at that moment, like this is yep. it. Like my life. Hey, listen, I went. I went to the changed. MEP center. I went to the MEP center in. in um, gosh, I was in Charleston, West Virginia, but we went to the MEP center in Beckley that morning and dad dad and mom actually drove me there it's about an hour drive uh and that was hard enough just saying bye to them in the car anyway so we get on the bus and we're headed for the airport at beckley to fly you know i think we we landed in chicago and then from chicago we went down to kelly or uh, lackland but um i'm trying to think exactly what happened oh yeah and the bus it was me and a guy from tennessee we're going to the air force and the other 28 people on the bus were marines and I was laughing because I knew the difference. The other kid with me didn't know the difference and neither did most of the Marines. But I told him, I said, you know what? I couldn't do what you're doing, but I'm really, really glad you do. Right. I'm really happy you guys can do it. You know, I'll do my part in the Air Force as long as you guys do your part in the Marine Corps. Uh, but I'm, I'm really happy you guys are doing it. So anyway, just a little story there on the way, on the way down to Lackland. Gateway to the Air Force. <laughs> Gateway to the Air Force. Yep. And I don't know if you've seen the new dorms now, but holy cow, it's a new well, we, basic training. Yeah we, yeah, we stayed in a thousand man dorms, the real big ones. Um, but I don't, I think you stayed there too, right? In a thousand man dorms? Or did you have I was in, ones? I was in the old school ones. Um, they the were ones definitely, we were in, yeah, yeah they're definitely old. I'm not exactly positive how old. And the dorms that I was in was the 323. Uh, vipers what they were called at the right. time. they're not there anymore that that group um or that squadron is gone uh, right. but it was right next to the parade field which you know at first we thought was really cool but then we realized we're the farthest away from literally everything <laughs> and i swear i had the worst yeah. shin splints of my life because i'm five <laughs> six trying to march with six foot three people and it just wasn't working yeah well the good news is all the six foot three people are ahead of you <laughs> You know, dress right. right dress. So you kind of, but anyway, uh, our, I was at 3711 and squadron and our dorm backed up against one of the back gates of Lackland. So I remember one time we were talking, we, we, after so many weeks, we were allowed to have radios and we listened to the radio and it was a rock band coming to San Antonio. And we actually thought about skipping the gate, you know, trying to sneak out, jump the gate, go to this concert. And then get back in time before anyone noticed we were gone. <laughs> y'all are y'all are braver than than most. No, 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 we didn't do it. We ended okay. up, of course, we didn't do it. You know, so because I think at that time one of the TIs were still staying there, staying the night with us, so we couldn't have done anything anyway. But I've seen TIs in people's lives just from stealing a pack of peanut butter. So I don't I don't know what would have happened to you for that, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't either. I don't want to think about that, but I'm I'm happy we did not do it and get caught. Let's put it like that. Yeah, my flight, we didn't listen well. My TI always said, you're either going to be the smartest flight or the strongest flight. 
<laughs> and we were definitely the strongest flight. And I can okay. to this day. <laughs> All right. That's good. Well, that's good. We had good people on our flight too. I mean, it was a good, it was, a, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I hated basic training. Um, I know you liked it, which, because that's just because the difference in our, you know, attitudes and the way we look at things. And that was a good thing. I was actually pretty surprised, but I didn't like it. I liked, I loved tech school. And then when I got in the regular air force, I loved the air force. So, you know, basic training is not, you can't judge your career by six weeks in Blackland. You know, you, you've got to give it a chance, get out there and live and, and do your job and do the best you can. And you might be surprised how cool the air force really is to be in at time. So. All right. So you're done with basic training. What's next yeah. for airman white? Well, I went to, we got on a bus uh, and went north to, well, actually, if we, our TIs were outside and we were headed for the bus. And of course, the rumors going around was don't say anything bad to your TI because they can stop you from going to tech school, you know, if you talk bad about them. Uh, and if we walk right past our tech sergeant, uh, France was the main guy. And I walked past him, I wanted to tell him, I really don't <laughs> like you, dude. But I didn't say anything. We went back, got on a bus, and I my tech school happened to be at Shepard Air Force Base up around Dallas uh, in Texas. So uh, I remember driving up there. It took about 12, 13 hours to get there on a bus. Um, and we got off the bus. And it was a Friday afternoon, Friday early Friday Friday evening. And the, the guy met us at the bus, said, here's, here's your room numbers, your keys, all that stuff. As soon as you get in your keys and get in your room, put all your stuff away, we'll see you Monday morning. I was like, excuse me, <laughs> oh, this is Friday night. You're going to see us Monday. What? Um, but that's the difference between then and now. So mm -hmm. I knew it was a big difference even when you went through several years ago. So but that was good. Ago. Yeah. How many? 16. Oh Lord. Okay. I was just thinking, I was thinking about this podcast and I thought, you know what next, well, not next month, the month after next February 2nd, I will have been retired for 20 years. Wow. Which is pretty much, what you guys are striving to get to. <laughs> so you've been done as long as most people's full careers in the Air Force. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and I spent 26 years in, so we're talking about almost, what, 46 years ago now, so when in February, but uh, uh, no regrets. It was a great career. I love I loved almost every minute of it. I mean, every ups and downs everywhere you go and what you do, but... Uh, um, when did you start it. really shaping, you know, like your, your own personal goals? Because I know you had a lot of goals. I know you wanted to be the best and you wanted to make your family proud. And, but like, right. you know, at what point did it click for you and you, and you knew you, what you wanted to do in the air force? Actually, I had been, my first assignment was in Milden Hall in England. And for Milden Hall, I went to the fifth combat comm group, uh, uh, in Warner Robins and Robbins air force base in Georgia. And, uh, about a year and a half into that tour, I was TDY a lot because the fifth combat comm group, you, you do a lot of your, you know, your combat communications groups. You go all wherever they need you. They send you there to set up communications. Um, and I was going through there and, and I had the feeling then that, you know what, I'm going to make a career out of this. So do I want to be enlisted? Do I want to be an officer? What do I, and your mom actually kind of pushed me towards being an officer, even though, you know, when you're an enlisted guy, you think you want to be enlisted most, you know, most of the time. And most, most enlisted guys stay that way and hopefully make it up to chief. Um, I went, I left, I got off, I left active duty on Palace Chase and went back home to Charleston, West Virginia in the Air National Guard. So for every year that you have left on your original um, contract, you have to spend double that time in the Air National Guard in order to be approved for Palace Chase. So I had a year left. So I had to spend two years in the Air National Guard. But once I got to Charleston in the Air National Guard, I started really enjoying myself. And the Air Guard at the time had a 100% tuition thing going on at the time for college. So I started college um, in a, with a business degree in West Virginia State University. Um, uh, went there for four years, worked full time, went there for four years, but it was paid for. And then the VA actually helped with the books and tuition, things like that as well. So I actually made money on the deal, but after four years, which which is really funny because if you think about it, I graduated, I think in 
late December of 84 and you were born December 10th of 84. <laughs> so right after you were born, I graduated from college. So anyway, it was crazy. But from that point on, I realized I wanted to be an officer and I let it be known that I was, I was hoping to be commissioned one of those days. So I did everything I could do to position myself. And it's one of the things I've always told all you kids is look, always be ready to take advantage of an opportunity. You never know when it's going to present itself. And mm -hmm. that's why you need to be ready all the time. You know what I mean? So if you don't know when an opportunity is going to be there, you need to be ready all the time, right? Yeah, I've, I've definitely taken that with me. Yeah. And, so, and it's always on my mind and, you know, being ready for it and then having the courage to go for it. You know what I yeah. mean? It's yeah, easier to just, I, I've kind of learned that, like, it, it's terrifying to, to say, yes, I'll run this or I'll do that. <laughs> But you need yeah. to just, I just do it. And then I deal with it later. <laughs> like, yeah, well, if I just you know go what, for it. I know it's a great opportunity. I know it, it, it will be yeah. challenging and I know it'll be hard. So I yeah. don't, I, you know, I've, this is what I've taken from you. I just don't overthink it. Right. I see the opportunity. It feels right. And I just, I say, yes, put my name on the paper and then, all right, we're doing it now. You go with it. I've always yeah. said, you know, you just make whatever changes you make in your life, you just make room for them. And you know, I'm not going to say every decision you make is going to be a good one, but any decision you make that will propel you forward can't always be bad. Um, and you've done that. I've done that. Um, as a matter of fact, when in 1985, I uh, actually won the Outstanding Airman of the Year for the eight, one of the eight Outstanding Airmen of the Year for the Air National Guard, which is at, as far as the Air Force is concerned, that's a MAGCOM award, MAGCOM level award. Uh, went to D.C. for a week to celebrate that. Because that's their headquarters. Which you, which, which you know what that's like, because we yeah. were just down in Louisiana celebrating yours last year. Um, but I went up there for a week, and I guess some of the folks up there that I met liked what they saw. They liked what they read my package. They, they liked the fact that I was an OAY, and they actually offered me a job. They're at the headquarters uh, Air National Guard Support Center at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. And this is one of those instances where you said, you know, you look at something like that and it's kind of terrifying because I'd been in West Virginia for seven years at that time. You were just born. I, you know, you, you were only, I think, like four months old when, when we went to D.C. to celebrate this. Um, but it was a I knew what I wanted to do and I wanted to move up and hopefully uh, be in a position to make a difference, a good difference. So as scary as it was, I knew I wanted to do it, and I did it. So I accepted the position with the Manpower Branch at the Air National Guard Support Center um, as a tech sergeant. I made master sergeant right after that, about a few months after, well, about a year after I was there. And I let the people up there know as well, I wanted to be commissioned one of these days, and I'd do whatever it took to do that. I already had my degree. Um, they said, well, let us look at you for about a year, and we'll see what happens. I'm like, okay, fine. If that's what it takes, that's what we'll do. Um, and like I've always told you guys, the kids, you know, you always strive to be the best you can possibly be. And it's like I, I think I, you and I talked about this many times. My dad and my mom had a lot, a very large impact on what, on how I looked at things in life. And my dad was one of those guys who always said, he was a pretty laid back guy, really quiet. But he always said, if you, you know, if you think there's something worth doing, you need to try to be the best at it. You know, you don't want to be in the you know, in the 25 percentile, you want to be up in the 75, 85, 90, 100 percentile. And my mom was probably one of the most competitive people I ever knew in my life, uh, other than me, um, and maybe you now, but uh, so that you get that combination of you want to be the best and you, you're the most competitive person you know. Um, those are two really good things to help you move forward, and mm -hmm. they really helped me a lot. So when the time came for um, them to offer me a commission, which is what happened actually, um, about three years after we were at Andrews, um, they offered me a position down in San Antonio, Texas, uh, or uh, Kelly Air Force Base as a, as a commissioned officer. I was, I was an E-8 at the time. I had a line number for chief, so I had, but I had seven years. I was only in for like 14 years, 13 and a half years at the time. So I had seven years to think, you know, what are you gonna do for the next seven years? Um, and I decided that I wanted to keep moving up and I thought I could make more of a difference as an officer 
So that's what I did. I accepted it. And, you know, November 91, I went to OT, I mean, officer training. And uh, that was an experience because I didn't like basic training in 1975. And I certainly did not like officer training in 1991. But you had a target on you this time, though, because you were, you were wearing that rank. I was at the headquarters, too. Right. So when I left the headquarters and went to, uh, you know, officer training, I, I remember the commandant down there told me one time uh, before I left, but, you know, I had been selected. And he said, we wait with bated breath, Sergeant White. And I'm like, I'm sure you do, sir. <laughs> he was a lieutenant colonel at the time. I said, I'm sure you do. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, he wasn't there when I got there. There, there was another commandant there. But anyway, um, I mean, it was, a, it was a great experience. I was able to hear, and here's another, another one of the things that I've always told you and, the other, and our other children, just to let people know. You're my only son, but I have um, five daughters. So... I've always told all of them, this is the same thing. You always try to be the best possible at what you can, at what you want to do. You try to be the best. There's a, the way I always looked at it is no matter what, you always somebody have somebody ahead of you, somebody above you, a supervisor, a boss, whatever. If you can be the best possible right-hand man or woman that you can be, you'll be in a position many times where that boss ahead of you is going to look at a situation and go, who can I trust to handle this? And you want him to think about you first. And if he so or she does. About, you're talking about being a, fo- a good follower. A good exactly, follower makes exactly, a great that's leader. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, this it's it's cliche to a certain degree. You know, you've got to be a great follower before you can be a great leader. But it's actually pretty true. You know, I mean. Definitely. Uh, and I tried my best to be the best right-hand man I could be. That's one of the things we talked about uh, earlier was. One of the things that I look at myself as I'm a very loyal uh, person, you know, if my boss needs something, I'm going to make sure he or she gets it as best I possibly can. I want to be the best right hand man or, you know, man, I could possibly be. And if something comes up and he needs he or she needs somebody to they trust to take care of that, I want them thinking about me first. Mm. And I happen to meet quite a bit, actually. <laughs> so uh, and I think that's pretty much how I got commissioned. But I, I got commissioned and my first job as an officer was was probably the mo- one of the most fulfilling. I was a, a commander right out the gate. And that doesn't happen to very many people. Well, it doesn't happen to very many EHs to get commissioned, number one. Um, but number two, to go right from officer training right into a command position, it's I don't know what the odds are about that, or that, but I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So would you uh, say you were like more excited and looking forward to it? Or were you more like, holy crap, what did I get myself into? Well, you go through the whole, the whole gamut there. I mean, you, you think to yourself, oh, man, what have I done? It would have been easier to start off as a second lieutenant somewhere down the line. You know what I mean? And work your way up. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you want to lead and you want to make a difference, you know, you got to get in those positions as soon as you possibly can. And I just happened to be fortunate enough to be selected for a, a, a command position at the 149th TAC Fighter Group in uh, Kelly Air Force Base, Texas. And uh, it was a very, very re- rewarding 18 months of, of my time in the, in the Air Force. I loved every minute of it. Um, what made it after so that, of course? Because, I mean, when, me? you, when you land a rewarding job... I feel like everything in your life just improves. You know what I mean? Like you're working out more, you're getting better sleep. Like when you got your work life, when and if, if it's fulfilling yeah. and you're yeah. impacting people's lives, it, it just rubs off on you. And, you know, I'm just curious. Not only like, that. What was so rewarding about it? Did you yeah. create that environment or was it just the people that you were with or how, how did you make that happen? Well, it, it helped when you have good people who look to you for leadership. You don't have... Uh, you don't have people arguing with you. You have people looking to you to lead, you know, because you're a commander and, and that's what you're expected to do that. So that's what you do. Um, I mean, I remember running the, you know, the, every year you had to run the mile. I guess you guys still have to do that. I don't know. You know, the PT stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember getting my group of people out there and I would run the mile with the first five or six people that worked for me and we'd run that mile. And I, I was out in front saying, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. You guys can make this, you can do this. 
And then I'd, we'd get back across the finish line. Then I'd run with the next five or six people, you know, and until the, until the flight was all done with that, but we never had one failure in there. And I think one, I would like to think one of the reasons are is because I was always with them running with them. And they would always think, well, here's our commander is, you know, you only have to run this thing once. He's been out here five times today, uh, making sure we make this. So they worked their butts off to make sure they did. And, and that's, you know, I guess that's what leaders do to make, help people understand that if I'm willing to do that five times, you only have to do it once in a day, or once a year. Um, I think it makes it easier for them to make up their mind that they're going to do this and they're going to make it happen. So So you were leading by example and then some. Yeah, 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 exactly. Leading by example. That's a good, yes. I I feel like leading by example is just the tried and true, just, you know, if if you have no tools and you have no idea where to even begin, leading by example, learning what your airmen are doing and just helping them out, I feel like is. Yeah. Well, I had, I, had hey, kind I have of a kids leg. in my room here, y'all. If you hear, hey, all right, you have my grandkids there. You mean? <laughs> yes, your grandkids. <laughs> uh, I think. Hey, I, summer's I think, gonna be in every video in podcast. She's that's, that's okay. Just her thing. That's her thing. That's all right. She's our little Amen. princess. You know that. Yep, only girl. Yeah, yep. only only little girl. You know what's crazy? And I'll say this real quick. Um, we had one boy and five girls. Our one boy had a girl, and our five girls ha- all had boys. I mean, how, what are the odds of that? You know, uh, <laughs> slim and none, as they say in Texas, slim and none. Slim to none. That's right. <laughs> uh, that's good. But, you know, getting back to the conversation, I think that what helped me do that was I was already an E8, so I'd already been in the military for 14 years. Uh, when I got commissioned. And like I said, it doesn't happen to a lot of people. I was very thankful, very fortunate that it happened to me. But that gave me a leg up on, you know, maybe a 21 or 22 year old second lieutenant. Here I am a second lieutenant with a rack of ribbons. I was an E8. I mean, you'd think it would be easy for me, but, you know, leadership is never that easy. But uh, uh, I already had a plan and a way of doing things that were successful in the past. So I just applied it, you know, to the new position I was in. So it was good. It was a great, it was a great year and a half there at Texas. Our, getting back to what you were saying earlier about leading by example, though, I remember one of the things I was tasked with before I got there was installing a local area network uh, for Kelly Air Force Base, for the Air National Guard in Kelly Air Force Base. So we had to run our own fiber, uh, fiber optics. So, I mean, we had a whole bunch of different things we had to do. Um, uh, we had an ENI squadron on base that was engineering installation squadron. Uh, that was going to lay the cable for us. They did a little bit and then they had to go TDY because those guys were always doing, you know, jobs around the world with uh, fiber optics and different things. So we ended up having to do most of our own cable. So I remember one, we were out in the field one time, we, we, we had dug this ditch across the field and we were laying PVC down to run cable through. And that my, my command, my, my boss, uh, Colonel Klein, Lieutenant Colonel Klein came out and he said, Bill, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, we're running cable, sir. We got to get this local layer network up. We got, you got to get the cable in before we can do that. And he goes, you need to get out of the ditch. And I'm so, you know what, sir, with all due respect, we're going to finish this job. Then I'll come see you when, when we get done. Oh, dang. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I, I'm not going to have my people out there digging ditches. You know what I mean? And, right. and I think that part of that is being, prior enlisted probably right when you but Colonel Klein, a bunch he, of airmen working like that you know and you're just hanging out you know and you could be helping of stand course there like, and watch. you know i'm you not got, gonna stand there and watch it. you can't watch no you got to get in there you got to get in the fight well we were successful just to let you know we we ran all the cable we needed to run and we had our local internet network up and running <clears throat> but that was one of the things they wanted me to accomplish um you know after i got there so we did that and uh I was very proud of all those guys and those gals because we had a couple of gals out there doing the same thing. So um, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But That's I remember awesome. Colonel Klein one time. He just looked at me and laughed and said, yeah, yeah, all right, Bill, all right. And you might have taught him something that day. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I learned from younger airmen, you know, all the time. You know, I don't always flat out tell them. Sometimes I do. But, yeah, I've, I've, I've met some pretty incredible airmen who have been in half the time as me and 
they'll do or say something where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to use that. Like, that's, that's pretty awesome. You know what I mean? There's hey, no listen, shame in that. You never listen. And I've told you this before. You never quit learning from others. You never quit learning. You never quit teaching and you never quit learning. Always. You're always teaching, always learning, especially if you're in a, you know, uh, like you're a master sergeant. I mean, you're, are you in NCYC now? Of, uh, I'm right now, I, I was over uh, at Whiteman. I was the NCYC of all of public health. It's much okay. smaller. And then here at Eglin, I'm over community health. It's a much larger flight. Right. Okay. Well, the point is, though, is that your leadership position, you never quit learning and you never quit teaching. Never. So, right. Never close your mind. No one says because you're the NCOIC or you're the commander that you have a corner on all the good ideas. In fact, if you're a good NCOIC and you're a good commander, you know other people have really good ideas. And just exactly what you said, I don't have any problem using a good idea just because it came with somebody from someone else. Right. You know? I feel so, like the longer you've been in, the more the easier you can spot talent. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, you can just you just see that airman that you just know just has it, just has it to, yep. to take you to the next level. And all you got to do is encourage that person. It might not be. Hi, daddy. Hi. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm talking to Baba right now. But the key to that is, Josh, is that you can see the really good airmen, the decision makers, the, one who want, the ones who want to get out in front, what mm -hmm. we used to call when I was in the service, the fast burners. Mm -hmm. Um but you also have those that aren't fast burners and I'll go dot, dot, dot yet. Mm. And, it's, and it's up to you to help them become fast burners. You know oh, what I, I mean? Like that. Yeah. You got you to find their why. What, what's their why? What drives them? What motivates Yeah, exactly. Them? One of the questions you asked me, what's your why? But the point is, is that, you know, you can, like you said, you can recognize your fast burners right off the bat. You know who they mm -hmm. are. They don't have any problem making decisions. You put them in a group. They want to lead right away. Um, you know, they've got great ideas and they act on them. Um, but you also have people who want to just do a good job. And they're, they're not fast burners, per se. They just want to be good at what they do. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Right. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, you can, some people want to be fast burners and don't know how. But that's why you're there. You know, so you can show them this is what this is what we're looking for when we talk about fast burner, you know, um, if you want to be there, I'll help you get there. And, you know, I could have, I have to tell you, Josh, uh, a lot of people don't know this yet. I know it because you're my son. We talk a lot that uh, you really, really do help the people around you get better. And that's what makes you better too. And I'm really proud of you for that. And uh, I know there's a lot of people out there in the Air Force right now doing to others what you did for them. And that's how things keep going. That's Multiplies, how the Air yeah. Force becomes so great, you know? Right. So I'm really proud of you for that. Yeah, it just clicked for me at one point. Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, that means a lot coming from you, obviously. So thank you. And, uh, you know, it just clicked for me at some point, like, hey, we're all in this together. Like, we need to figure this out together. And then when, and then, you know, I've made so many mistakes in, in my life, in my career. And if I can help them, avoid those mistakes they're going to be mm -hmm. that much more successful so i see it like that too if i recognize right. someone with something holding them back like i had a lot of anxiety and fear of getting out of my comfort zone you know i really struggle sure. with that sure and, and i know how amazing it feels to break through that and to see what you're really capable of so you know I, if i recognize that behavior with someone else i'm gonna 100 percent try to help them you know by explaining my own story get past it and then hopefully get them out of their comfort zone. And then when you see an airman do that and, and how proud of themselves they are and their sure. family's proud, I mean, there, sure. there's really no greater feeling than that. Like as a, as an NCO or, or senior NCO. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You know what? It's okay to succeed. It's okay to be really good at what right. you do. Um, and it's also okay to get help from someone else to do that. You know, like your boss or another or a coworker, or wingman or whatever, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to say, you know what, I'm going to be like you or uh, I want to be better than you, uh, whatever. But someone's always there in the Air Force to help you do that. That's one of the things my dad explained to me before I got in was he said one of the things the difference between the Air Force here, I'm going to get myself in trouble because I'm sure there's a lot of military people going to listen to this. But all my dad five of said, them. Huh? I said all five of them. <laughs> yeah, the Guardians as well, right? So, uh, but he said, 
out of the Army, the Navy, Marine Corps, all the the Air Force, when when a supervisor you, supervisor asks you to do something, they will always tell you why. That's not necessarily true in a lot of the other services. Maybe today it is. When he was in, he retired in 1973. So I'll let you know when he was, you know, how far back he was actually in the Air Force. But one of the things I took to me in the Air Force when was what he told me. He said, you know, one, never, never be afraid to ask why they're having you do this because they'll take the time to explain to you. And you know what? They always did. No one ever told me when I asked them, well, wait a minute, why are we doing this? And we could do this and this and this. No one ever told me, shut the hell up and just get it done. You know, no one ever right. did that to me in 26 years. They always took me, they looked at me for a minute, like, why is he asking me this question? Mm. But they always took the time to say, all right, Sergeant White, this is why we're doing it. This is why I need you to do this and this and this and this. And you know why they did that? Because they knew I would do a better job if they, if I knew what I was working for. Yeah, they you were know? investing in you. Exactly. And so exactly it's right. funny you say that because, you know, that you've been in for a hot minute. Obviously, Paul Paul White was in a long time ago. And so that, that, that value yeah. has transcended so many years is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it reminds me of Simon Sinek. He's an author that a lot of military people are, are really drawn to his writings. It's very uh, applicable to the military lifestyle. And he came to speak at Whiteman Air Force Base. And, and he said the one factor that puts the Air Force above the rest uh, you know, what makes them different, should I say, right. uh, was that they asked, they allow for few for free communication up and down the chain. Well, there you and go. That, yeah. Like he legitimately spoke on that being the difference. So that's amazing to me that they're yeah. still, you know what I mean? That's my dad told me that in 1973, 74. Uh, I've told innumerable airmen that over my 26 years. And now you're still, you're talking about the same thing. And it was a civilian, an outsider who said it. You know, right. that makes it even more impactful. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I was, I mean, I was blown away by it, you know, especially you bringing it up that it's been that yeah. way for many, many years. That's crazy. <laughs> but no, I pride cool. myself in that. I love that we can ask why and we can communicate more. That just makes us that much more effective. So it really does. I, I'm really glad that, you know, that was the branch I chose because I don't think I would have fit in well in, with the other ones. I don't think my personality, <laughs> it, it wouldn't have worked out, you know? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, Josh. You know what? I know you very well and you've excelled at everything you've done, whether you like to be there or not. And I know this, I won't get into this in this podcast, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You, you excel regardless of whether you like where you're at, whether you like what you're doing, you don't, it doesn't matter. You excel at what you do. And it's because you want to be the best at what you do, regardless of what you're doing. If you're digging a ditch, I'm going to be the best ditch digger on base. Right. You know what I mean? If I'm, if I'm working the chow hall, I'm going to be the best fried chicken guy there is in the chow hall. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's all anybody can really ask. And Definitely. it's those kind of people you look for when you want to get things done. So Definitely when I was preparing for this was insightful questions. Yes. You can give some insight into, into myself. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions on that was, you know, how are you known uh, by your Air Force colleagues, civilian colleagues, whatever? And, and I, I think the answer I came up with, I'm most known both in military and uh, civilian life and my professional life by leading by example, which we talked about, and achievement through consensus. And achievement through consensus, I know you know what it means, but it, it, you achieve and you do great things, not just good things. You do great things when your entire group is in on everything that has to be done. You know what I mean? That's like I said earlier, nobody has a corner on great ideas. Um, you, can, you can be the kind of boss, and I've had a couple of these in the Air Force. You can be the kind of boss that comes down and says, here's what we have to achieve. Here's how we're going to do it. Let's get started. You know, uh, I was never like that. I'm still not like that. Um, but you, you get to a point where you, whether you have three people working with you, and I don't say working for you, I say working with you, because that's really what happens, no matter what rank anybody is, you're working together. Mm -hmm. um, whether you have three or 15 or 25 or 30 or 50, it doesn't matter. If you get consensus 
between the majority of all those people or all of the people that are working for you as far as what your what your mission is and what your goals are and what it is you end up you want to end up having to accomplish you'll do it a lot faster and a lot more successfully with consensus and you will just order and people saying all right you do this you do this you do this you do this let's go get to work and and, and I, i'm not saying that can't be effective i'm just saying i was more effective um with using consensus among the group of people that I was working with. You know, whether I was the boss or whether I wasn't the boss, consensus was always uh, uh, very important. So your question was, how, how was I known professionally? That was because of that. I always led by, or tried to lead by example. Now, I'm not gonna say, look, every now and then there's stuff that comes down the pipe where you mm -hmm. gotta take care of right now. So there are times when you gotta tell people, look, we gotta get this done by tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. I need you to do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Those times, I mean, they're there. It's realistic. That's mm -hmm. realism. You, those times are there. But the times where you have something big to accomplish and you have the time to do it, you need to get consensus among all the people working with you. And you work a lot better together when you do that. I guarantee no, you that. I, I, I agree. Um, and you learn that that's effective when you think you have the best idea. Right. And then you bring it to the table. You're just, just to, <laughs> just to check. <laughs> and then someone completely annihilates it. Oh, you can you can see it in their face, you right? Know, and then you're like, the "Oh, thank God I asked." Because holy yeah, I'm cow. like, uh, "Yeah, thank God I asked." That's right. I mean, I've come to come to learn that I have the best idea out of ten, and I need to present all ten, and then you help me find that one gem in there. <laughs> but I, I have the idea somewhere, but I need your help, like narrowing that idea down. Yeah. And uh, oh, to, to have that, you know, solid team getting your back and people that you know that you can bounce these ideas off of. That's what makes right. a really good team. If they're, if they're invested in what you're doing, they're much more inclined to do it well. And in you know today's what I Air mean? Force, we call that all in. Is that all in? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. If that, yeah, if they're all, if everybody's all in because you've included them, uh, in the decision-making process, the idea generating process, they're just more invested or they're more, you know, they're more all in and right. you're going to get a much better job done. Right. Because now quicker. they feel like they, they, you know, they have some ownership on that plan now. That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. And these are new concepts, Josh. I mean, I, I, like I told you earlier in the podcast, I've been retired for almost 20 years. In February, it'll be 20 years. And we're still talking about the same kind of things. We have different words for what we're talking about. Right. But they're the same thing. You know, uh, and I'm sure there was the same thing when my dad was in. We didn't get in a lot of conversations about how things happened, you know, when when he was in the Air Force. We talked about a few things, but I think it's I think it's it says a lot about the concept when I can tell you that in 1985 we were doing the same kind of things I'm talking to you now, and you're telling me that you guys are doing the same thing now, you know, 20 years later. Uh I think it's great. And that's what I, you know what, I think that's what makes the Air Force a great, such a great organization. We keep, uh, we keep all those good habits and, and get rid of all the bad ones. That's what we're trying to do here. That's, so yeah, I'm, I'm really, yeah, I'm really hopefully. glad that's to hear that we're doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. So one okay. problem that you saw back then and that you're probably seeing now is, you know, people going through a really hard time and, and not handling that very well. And that's, that's, a human being issue, but I feel yeah. like in the air force, we're really trying to resolve it any which way we can. Right. Um, and your experience with like depression and anxiety and, and suicides right. rising, what, you know, what, how did you help with your own depression and anxiety? And, and what would you tell an airman today that might be, you know, feeling that way, feeling alone? Well, I, well, I think your last two words says it all feeling alone, you know, uh, you're only alone. I, here's my, you know, everybody has their own opinion on everything. And I get that. But, uh, you know, I struggle with depression a lot and anxiety, not so much. I've kind of learned how to handle that. But the depression thing is like, it's so insidious, insidious that uh, you think you got a beat and then you turn around the next day and you don't have a beat, you know, whatever happens, you it's know, it's always you right know. behind you. It's always right behind right. you. It's no matter how good, down the road. No matter how That's good right. you're feeling, it's, it's, exactly. it's always there. So, but your last two words were alone, you know, think you're alone or whatever. You're only alone if you're not talking to someone. You know, I'm not talking about your wingman or your buddy or your supervisor. I'm talking whoever it takes that you trust 
to discuss what's going on in your life and what's making you feel the way you feel. Um, if you're talking to them, you're not alone. You know, uh, I mean, I can tell you personally, um, you know, I've struggled with depression for a long time. You're not alone simply because I've been struggling with it. That doesn't mean you and I are talking about it, but you know, someone else is going through it, you know? Um, but if you, if you're talking to somebody, you're not alone. If you're not talking to somebody, you're on your own. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now. It's a hard thing to beat. As a matter of fact, you can't beat it. You just have to kind of learn to deal with it. Um, but the only way to do that is talking to someone, you know, and uh, well, there's medication too, but that only goes so far. Um, you really need to be able to find someone you can talk to and confide in and trust. Um, and here's the thing. Most people who want to talk about things like that don't want to hear what you have to say about it. They just want you to listen to them. Mm. You understand? So when people come to you and say, hey, you know, Sergeant White, I'm, I mean, this thing's kicking my butt. I just kicking my, I don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. You, they're not necessarily asking you for a solution. I'm not saying you can't offer one, but you have to be able to look as a supervisor. You have to be able to look at the fine line between asking for help and wanting someone to listen. So a lot of times people jump right on that. Well, if you do this, 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 and this, you know, you'll be better. Well, that's not, that's not what they want. They just want someone to listen to them. Then when they come back to you and say, you know what, I think you were right. And I'm, I'm, I'm thankful you listened to me. What do you suggest? That's when you get involved with, this, you know, helping them to move down the line on this thing. They just need to understand that there are people out there that can help. And you're only alone if you're not talking to someone, you know, okay. talk to somebody. And the stigma, I mean, when I was talking about depression back in 19, I was still in the military and there was a stigma there. I don't know if it's still in or not, but there was a stigma there. If you went to get help for depression, whatever, people were like, uh, can we really depend on this guy, you know, to do what right. he needs to do? He's depressed. He's going to see a guy, a psychiatrist. He's on medication, you know. Well, I can tell you all the things that I've achieved in my career, a lot of them happened after my, you know, my, uh, uh, the doc said I was depressed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you can be successful as long as you stick to the things that have helped you be successful, but you're only alone. If you're not talking to somebody, you need to talk to somebody. Definitely. You know, and there are people, believe it or not, there are people trained to, to talk to you, to help you with what you're going through. If that's what you're going through right now, talk to somebody and then you won't be alone anymore 100 percent. and if they don't work out for you find someone else you know there's a lot of doctors out there you don't have to stick with one just because just because the airport says you got to go see captain such and such and you go see captain such and such and they don't understand what you're trying to say then get it get someone else there's a whole bunch of captain such and such is in the air force that can listen to you and you'll find one only if you go looking but you're only it's alone a, if you don't it's talk. It's a to marathon, someone. not a sprint, too. Uh, that's yeah. Well, yeah. That's you know we got to exactly take our right. time, and it it's you know for me personally, I'm either going. I feel like I'm either you know attacking or retreating, kind of mindset. Right. I'm right. either fearless and I feel great, and I'm you know I'm getting after it, and I have the energy to do it, or right. I'm eating like crap. Now I'm on my phone instead of sleeping. Now I'm not right. calling my family. Now, you know, so. I feel like right. there's a lot of momentum into it and it takes time. Sure. Um, it's much easier to go down than up, but, you know, just making little progress day by day, sticking to, you know, your own standards uh, that right. you set for yourself and you just build that momentum day by day. Sure. Just little victories day by day to get yep. you back to baseline. That, that's what I've done in my own experience when I've, I've been in moments where I truly just was like, holy cow, how am I going to get through this? Right. Um, it started with just something simple, making my bed, yeah. brushing my teeth, shaving. Okay, great. Sure. You know, making, forcing myself to hold a meeting just so I can talk with everyone and catch up being social, you sure. know, just, and just little by little day by day, you know, I'm back right. to me. So I, I think building momentum and, and treating it like a marathon versus a sprint is because there's not, there's nothing overnight about it. It does. There's no. no overnight fix unfortunately no. you know it takes no. a lot of time and work uh and soul searching it does it does you're right absolutely right so i mean anybody out there listening to this 
you know, listen to what Josh just said and what I've been talking about. And, you know, like I said, I, I've been there. I can, let me tell you a little thing about medicine too. I, I, when I was first diagnosed, they put me on some medicine and the, the psychiatrist asked me a couple of weeks after I started taking it. So what's the difference? And I told him, and it was true. I mean, I, you know, I have a reason to lie to this guy. I mean, I wanted him to help me. Um, and I told him, I said, you know what? Taking this medicine makes me feel like I'm not walking uphill anymore. I'm on level ground now. And that means a lot. You don't know how hard it is to walk uphill sometimes until you've been doing it for a long time. Mm. When you get back on level ground, you wonder how in God's name did I walk uphill for so long, you know, when I didn't have to. So talk to somebody, you know. And don't be afraid of taking medicine. Don't be afraid of the stigma. I'm not saying there aren't supervisors in the Air Force that still prescribe the stigma, whatever. Um, but this is about you. So you need to take care of yourself. And uh, that comes first. That comes first. Exactly right. You can't take care of anybody else, family, supervisor, people who work for you. You can't take care of anybody else until you're taking care of yourself. So talk to somebody. All right. Well, I think that... Uh, leads us to the end of our podcast episode okay. number one with <laughs> dad, a.k.a. Major White. Um, retired. <laughs> retired. And yes. GS13 retired. Yes. many A man of many titles. Um, and, you know, I get a lot of inspiration from the Llama Lounge, um, which is held uh, by Chief Bogdan. And he does a phenomenal job at doing something kind of similar to what we're doing right now, talking to a bunch of different people in the military or experts. And I, I get a lot of inspiration from him. And he has he ends every podcast with four questions. And they're just kind of insightful questions. They're kind of fun to ask. So um, we're just going to come up with some right now. So first question, what is your favorite quote and why? You're asking me that? I'm asking you that, yeah. Okay, well... Um... Gosh, so there's like a bunch of them. I actually come right to mind. I'm not sure who wrote them down or who you know brought them up. Um, um, gosh. Okay. How about since based on what we were talking about just a little bit earlier, how about it's the stones in a brook that make it sing? I don't know who wrote that down, but it's true. I mean, if you didn't have any rocks in a stream or a brook, you wouldn't hear anything. It just the water just be running down. But the stones getting in the way make this brook sing. You see what I mean? So what situation would you remind yourself of that quote? Probably pretty much what we were just we just discussed about uh, getting help. I mean, I, what that means to me is, is that life isn't a quiet stream. Life is always broken up with stones where you have to, you know, if you're water, you're rushing around them. At the same time, you're making a certain kind of music. Uh, because you're getting around them, up, over them, under them, beside them, whatever. And as you do that, you're making some kind of music. That's why it's, 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 wow. it's the stones in a brook that make it sing. So it's pretty beautiful, actually. <laughs> I, I, I love that. About that. Many, many years. Yes. I love that. Okay. Um, second question. Have you learned more from good leaders or bad leaders? <sighs> well, I, here, okay. Let me tell you real quick. I know we're running out of time. Um, the two worst supervisors I had in my career in the Air Force was my first one and my last one. Everybody in between, unbelievable, a great career. But to answer your question, it's almost 50-50 because when you look at the guys or the gals or the ladies or whatever who um, that you, you think are bad supervisors, you learn from them because you don't want to be like them. Mm-hmm. Um, you learn from them because when they make you feel small or insignificant because, you know, you didn't do as uh, work as well up to their expectations as they thought you should, um, you learn from that. And you, when the people behind you, when you're a master sergeant and you're looking at airmen first and senior airmen, you need to keep in mind what you learn from those supervisors that were bad as far as you're concerned and don't do that. You see what I mean? Don't mm -hmm. belittle or make people feel bad because they didn't work up your expectations. You know what you do? You teach them something. On the other hand, all the great supervisors I had, they taught me everything I needed to know to hopefully be a great supervisor myself. So, 50 -50. so it's 50-50. Okay. Yeah. What leadership characteristic do you value the most? People listen to you. 
and they want to know your input. They want to know what you have to say. They want to know how you think this job should be done. They want to know why you failed at the job. They want to know without, without judging you. They just want to know why, what happened. You know, so a supervisor who or management official so who, are, who will listen to you and they really want to hear what you have to say, that's that's more important than pot of gold. Okay, nice. Because you know you can trust them and go to them. If they ask you a question, you know they want to know the answer. Right. It's you know very I mean? it's it's insightful if they come to you with these questions. You know exactly. You know they're comfortable. Exactly. It's it's kind of it's also insightful when they come to you for nothing. Well, that's true too. I mean, right. my command, I had a commander one time that used to say, Hey, Bill, keep your golf clubs in your trunk of your car. And I'm like, okay. He said, because you never know when I'm going to come have you play golf with me. I'm like, Oh, okay. So I kept my golf clubs in my car trunk. And I, I don't know how many times we did it, but he would come to me at lunchtime or maybe a little bit after lunch and say, I'm having a hell of a time today, Bill. Let's go play golf. I'm like, yes, sir. Let's go. And we go play golf. That is the most 90s Air Force thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Y'all cracking <laughs> Bud Lights. I'm, I'm sure it is. And you know what? I'm not wearing gonna say aviators. <laughs> just wearing aviators, just getting after it on the golf course in the middle of the day. Love it. Uh, all right. Yeah. Last question. All right. What is your proudest Air Force moment? Oh, well, oh, well, they got a whole bunch of those too, Josh. Oh, man. All right. I have to say I've got two equally proud moments. How about that? So I get I get two since I'm the since I'm the guy who gets to answer the questions. It's my choice. Yeah. I get two of it's them. your choice. You get two then. Okay. All right. I'd have to say that my and these are both there's no above or another. They're equal. But I would have to say that swearing you into the Air Force was probably one of the proudest moments of my life. And it wasn't an achievement on my part. It was an achievement on your part. And as a dad, you just can't beat that. You just can't beat it. And that was probably one of the proudest Air Force moments, even though I was retired at the time. Probably the, one of the most proudest achievements, I think. It was for me, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, because I really I, wasn't, I didn't really know what all that meant until, you know, we're at the building and I see, 30 airmen swearing in from one officer at the same time. Right. Right. And they, that happens more often than not. Yeah. Right. And then they all exit so that we could have this like intimate, like setting yep. one-on-one -on -one, yep. father and son yep. swearing me in. And then it really hit like, Whoa, this like my dad can do this. For, like <laughs> he can, he can do this for me. Like this is, he must be. Yeah. The audience like, was Kathy. I mean, she was the only right. one in the audience. So, yeah. so, I mean, it was a very special moment and it did make me proud. I felt like I was, you know, following your footsteps. It was really cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, you were. In fact, you know, through your career, you, I think you've stepped in almost every step I've taken. You, yeah, we, you know, we were similar. equal in a, a lot of ways, very similar careers. So, I mean, before you know it, I'll be playing golf with my commander, <laughs> with your commander. in the middle of the day. I remember just a quick note. I remember okay. one time I told one of my, my supervisor, he was a captain at the time. He said, uh, I said, look, I, the commander told me to keep my golf clubs in my car. He goes, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Just let me know when you're leaving. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, he was a captain. So um, I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. He said, oh, just do yourself a favor and don't beat him. Oh. And I'm like, well. Interesting I dynamic. I never lose on purpose. I'm sorry. I just don't. And I don't, <laughs> I'm not going to lose on purpose. I'm too competitive for that. So I'd say between me and the commander at the town, I don't know how many times we played, but I'd say we were probably 50, 50 in wins and losses, but he never got on me for beating him. So Damn. then again, I never laughed at him for beating him either. So, right. Yeah. But the second one, I, I said two things. The second one is when I was, uh, I was um, sworn in as a commander. That was a highlight in my career. You can't, you just can't, I don't know how many people in the Air Force get to be commanders, but I don't think it's very many. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a it was an extreme honor for me. And that to me, that was the pinnacle. Even though I went back to the headquarters after that, you know, two years after that, uh, and did a bunch of other things, those two years as a commander were awesome, simply awesome. Just the, the title alone. It's in a it's in a pretty amazing job. And as you know, I got to be a yeah. med group commander's exec for a year, for a year. Yes, Shout yes, out to yes, Colonel yes. Henderson. Yep. Um, I got to know a group commander 
you know, one-on-one got to know her, her thoughts, her insights, her behind the scenes, her struggles, yeah. her victories. Yeah. And wow, the job is so powerful. It impacts so many lives Yeah. that I I'm absolutely can see that that would be a proud moment for you. Cause that's, it's an incredible title, incredible position. And it, it's very I think rewarding. What, I think what blew me away about it was, is that somebody asked me one time, what, what are your commander? What do you do? I'm like, well, 65 to 70 percent of being a commander is personnel issues the rest of it is getting you know your job done but you've got so many personnel things going on well you probably know that as, oh you know, you're, yeah you're, i would see yeah, them you know well, they would they would tell me things you know they're waiting to see her and they would just tell me everything <laughs> and i you know i was i kept all the secrets you know i didn't say yeah. anything about it but i yeah. knew a lot um and yeah you're you're absolutely right it's it's yeah. keeping the team on track uh yeah. keeping everybody sane and level-headed yeah, and yeah, hey yeah. we can do this guys here's how we're gonna do it having yeah. someone to believe in you and yeah exactly. it takes an insane amount of people skills yeah 100%. it really does <laughs> i learned a lot in those two years it's better like that hold Go on ahead. i want to show you something i want to show you something real quick okay this is from the this is from the old days okay i don't know if you hopefully you can see this can you see that you have to back it away a little bit. Oh, there's your co- your commander stamp right there. Yeah, it's a stamp. You don't yep. do these anymore. <laughs> but, you know, when I was a commander, they had them. Wow. Did you read it? Yeah. Yeah, any- yeah, anyway. Look at that. That's you still got it. one of my favorite it. possessions right there, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. A great career. I loved every minute of it. So. Dang. Well, you're still, you're still, you're, you're living vicariously through me now and guiding me. So you're still in it. You know what? You're exactly right. Um, I've called you many times and vented many times. So thank you for that. Um, So that wraps it up, folks. That was episode one of the podcast with my dad. Uh, Hope you enjoyed it. More to come. We love you guys. Peace.